Well, welcome back to 42nd Street Pete's Grindhouse. It has been a week to the day since my appendix almost burst, and I thank all you people that were concerned about my health and well-being. Uh, it is vastly appreciated. Um, and some people that actually dropped everything and came over to help me out, that is vastly appreciated. Uh, what is not appreciated, though, is the lack of... Uh, whatever from my uh, health care professionals. Um, hospital was great, the surgeon was great, but this thing could have been avoided and uh, I may have to speak on this later because it seems like the only way you get a reaction from people that don't return phone calls is basically to do something on the internet because everything is on the internet. Um, I have a problem with this whole thing because um, I have a flip phone that has about a one inch screen and people persist in sending me texts that I can't read nor can I answer. So that's uh, something that's going on here. Um, I decided, being that I'm going to be basically housebound because I can't drive um, because of this thing uh, for a while, so I was thinking why not do a summer of sleaze, for lack of better words. Why not basically talk about films that ran I don't know, from like 1970, from when I got my driver's license, to the mid-70s. Because when I got my driver's license, I would bounce between drive-ins and grindhouses. And sometimes you'd see a film at a, a drive-in that you'd basically have to go re-see at uh, a grindhouse because outside viewing sometimes is a lot darker than inside viewing, so you'd miss a bunch of shit. So, oh, another thing I gotta talk about here is I picked up this book, Hollywood Godfather, um, that was written by Gianni Russo. Um, he played Carlo in The Godfather. And I gotta take a lot of this with a grain of salt. Because he's a New York guy, you know, he goes his whole thing about how he got involved in the whole thing, things about Frank Costello, Joe Colombo. Marilyn Monroe, the Kennedys, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. Seems he was a mover and shaker out in Vegas and had a run-in with Pablo Escobar because he shot one of Pablo Escobar's guys in his nightclub or something. Again, I'm taking all this with a grain of salt. Um, not saying that I know a lot of mobbed up people, you know, from whatever. Um, I... I ran into people later on in my career working for liquidators in New York and the only actually mobbed up people I ran into was when I lived when I was living in Jersey so um, I have no real insight in the whole thing it just seems like this thing for lack of better words seems a I don't know I'm gonna leave it to you I mean I enjoyed the read maybe it's fact maybe it's fiction I don't know but I think you can pick this up on uh, Hamilton booksellers for like six bucks instead of uh, $17.99. So, again, it may be real, it may be Memorex, I don't know. Some of this stuff just, you know, doesn't ring true, you know. I guess everybody slept with Marilyn Monroe. Joel Reed, during an interview, said he did, too. So, I guess I'm the only one who didn't. <laughs> but anyway, going back to what I wanted to do with um, Summer of Sleaze, you know, how many great pictures, or not so great pictures, came out during the early 70s? Well, one was The Revengers from 1972, um, starring William Holden, Ernest Borgnine, and Woody Strode, and it basically a cameo appearance, or last film role, of uh, Susan Hayward. Um, basically, it's William Holden playing a rancher who was basically a Civil War hero named John Benedict. And his family is massacred by a bunch of common cheros led by a guy named Tarp. So he follows them with the posse to the border and basically says goodbye to the posse because he's going to pursue this on himself. So he finds out where Tarp's hideout is and basically has to recruit some men to go with him. So he goes into a Mexican prison where he meets Cholo, played by Jorge Martinez de Hoyos, who people would remember as one of the main peon characters in The Magnificent Seven, and also was in uh, The Professionals. A lot of crossover stuff. He did a lot of work in Mexico and a lot of work in the United States. 
he becomes the interpreter and basically he has to buy these guys way out as, as slave, slaves to work in his mine and pay off the commandant. So the first guy he sees is a former slave, Joe, being whipped uh, for insubordination, played by uh, the immortal Woody Strode. Uh, another guy he finds, Mr. Quiveron, is a Frenchman who's been trying to climb out of the prison for years. Uh, another guy who seems to be nameless, I think his name's Sensei or something like that, um, is this big, brutal guy who just likes to fight. He's played by, <coughs> played by Reinhard uh, Koldenhoff, who basically his career started back in the, early, the late 40s as he became one of those guys that became uh, sort of a fixture in spaghetti westerns, like uh, Reason to Live, Reason to Die. I believe he's been shouting the devil. And this really strange film I saw on late night TV, Adventures in Indochina, which was probably one of the only movies filmed in Vietnam before the war. And it's interesting, too. Um, the other player is Jorge Luke, who plays Chamaco, a gunfighter who actually uh, hit the big time when he played uh, this renegade Indian in Burt Lancaster's Yolanda's Raid. And last but not least, Ernest Borgnine, who plays Bill Hoop, a former Comanchero, who plays both sides of the law. So anyway, Benedict gets them out. Uh, of course, they beat up the guards. He basically outfits them with guns and horses and stuff, and all but Joe turn on him. They all come back. Uh, they do the raid on the uh, on Tarp stronghold, basically killing a whole bunch of people in a pretty good action sequence. But Tarp escapes, so they're basically tracking Tarp down. So Chamaco sort of uh, chum, uh, chummies up to uh, Benedict, thinking, asking if Benedict was in uh, this town at a certain time twenty years ago, because Chamaco has blue eyes and is sort of hinting around that. Uh, he might be Benedict's son, you know, from a ch close encounter with uh, a Mexican woman. So, there's a bunch of stuff with them, you know, chasing Tarp, and it ends up, this a shootout in this town that they had been in before, where Benedict has a twinge of conscience and rides away, and is drinking by himself when the whole gang shows up and Chamaco confronts him. Chamaco pushes the whole fact that he may be Benedict, Benedict's son, Benedict calls him a bastard, he draws on him, shoots Benedict, and leaves him for dead. Benedict is nursed, nursed back to health by uh, Mrs. O'Reilly, played by Susan Hayward, and there's the little love interest there, which really doesn't go anywhere, maybe until the end, if that's what it hints around. So, anyway, after he recovers, he makes the mistake of being in Mexico, and guess what? He's arrested by the same warden that he fucked over getting these guys out. Well, Hoop wanders into a bar now owned by Chamaco and lets it slip what happened, and of course, all the rest of these guys break him out. Uh, Chamaco asks if he's still looking for Tarp, and they find out that Tarp is being held prisoner by a union survey uh, group that is being besieged by the Comancheros. So the group goes in there and figures, Bishop figures he can end this whole thing by blowing Tarp away. Uh, the lieutenant in charge, played by Scott Holden, William Holden's son, forbids the whole thing to happen. So we have more gunplay, more of a gunfight, and oddly, Chamaco is the only one of the group to die. Bishop uh, uh, Benedict goes, shoots the lock off the thing, and there's Tarp, and Hoop is screaming in his, in his face, blow that ugly eye out of his ugly goddamn head, and Benedict refuses to do it and walks away, and Hoop yells, you got worms in your head, and Benedict sort of snickers and goes, no, I think I have worms in my heart, and gets on the, the horse and sort of rides away, but then gives a six-gun salute to the surviving members. Uh, this is one of those lame, downbeat 70s endings where, you know, it, it's sort of like the one guy who should have lived didn't, and the revenge that should have happened didn't. So the film sort of tanked at the box office but has, you know, a little bit of a history because uh, when you look at it, it's like maybe three years after the Wild Bunch debuted and it brought back and reunited 
Ernest Borgnine and William Holden, who were basically the two main characters in The Wild Bunch. Uh, Ernie was going through a bad divorce and couldn't wrap his head around his character until he decided to aim all the animosity he had in the character against the, his soon-to-be ex-wife. Um, the cast was great. I mean, it's, it's sort of an international cast when you think of it. I mean, Woody Strode, you know, was one of the first black superstars and had, you know, ventured over into uh, Europe to be in Once Upon a Time in the West, and basically that opened a door for him to work with a lot of these European actors. Uh, Roger Hannon, who played Quiveron, did a bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away in 2015. Woody Strode passed away in 1994 at age 80. Uh, Reinhard Kolderhoff, like I said, he had passed away in 1995. Uh, Jorge Martinez de Hoyos passed away in 1997. And Jorge Luke passed away in 2012. So basically, everybody involved in this film is pretty much gone. Uh, the film was released by this you know, little weird company called Cinema Center Films, who only released, I think, 30 or so films, but... Weirdly enough, it was like the first shark movie, uh, Blue Water, White Death, the western with Dean Martin, something big, uh, a lost film with Rod Taylor and William Smith called Darker Than Amber, also A Man Called Horse, The Boys in the Band, Monty Walsh, Prime Cut, two John Wayne westerns, Rio Lobo and Big Jake, and Little Big Man before they folded up. They also released a couple of Charlie Brown movies. It was an odd, eclectic mix of films. But that's the way it went. So, is The Revengers worth a watch? Yeah, it is. I mean, forget about the downbeat ending. There's enough action. There's enough interesting characters to keep you, you know, interested. And I think uh, what they were aiming for was sort of like a wild bunch motif, which they didn't really get. It's sort of like a reverse Magnificent Seven with all these guys that are basically really scumbags and like to kill people. So, that's our show for today. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for tuning in. Again, many thanks for all those who reached out concerned about my health. I truly appreciate it. And more thanks to the people who actually came over here and helped me out. Um, I'll be okay. I'm just going to have to make some hard decisions as to what to do to my continuing health care. So, until next time, we're going to keep this series going for a while. I'm going to come up with some more obscure stuff. So, definitely check out thefuseboxshow.com with my Roger Corman tribute with Mark Rose. And, uh... Stay safe, and we'll catch you on the flip side.